Uh, welcome back to the second day of String Math. To begin with, we will have uh, uh, Matt Bollimer, who will talk about the unitary categorical symmetry. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. Can you hear me well? Okay. Uh, so thanks to the organizers it's, uh, for the opportunity to speak. It's my first time here, actually, so it's a kind of great pleasure and really nice to present in this lecture theater that I've watched lots of great talks in online. And so I'd like to talk about categorical symmetry and how it interplays with unitarity. So the talk is about symmetry broadly and the type of symmetries that go beyond the paradigm of groups and representation theory and into the realm of things like higher categories and things like that. So there's been a lot of progress on these ideas in the last few years, and what I'd like to talk about is how those ideas uh, interact with, and, uh, with unitarity, and how unitarity is incorporated in those ideas. Okay. So I'll try to explain a bit more what exactly that means in a second, but uh, let me just say that this is some work with my PhD student, Thomas uh, Barch, and uh, Andrea Grigoletto, who's a, a postdoc in Durham, and uh, without both of whose kind of youthful expertise and enthusiasm, this project, I think, wouldn't have gone half as far as it has. Um, okay, so let me give a quick introduction to the ideas and what I'm trying to, hoping to achieve. So the talk is about symmetry in quantum field theory, and the general philosophy is that symmetries, we think about symmetries as topological defects in the quantum field theory. So there's some extended operators, perhaps, whose correlation functions don't depend too much on where you insert them, and so they have some topological nature to them. And so th this type of picture, I think, was introduced in Sysmet, oops, okay, that wasn't supposed to happen. Just check. Okay, maybe I pressed the wrong button. Okay, so this uh, this type of idea I think was introduced or systematized in, in 2014, and there's been lots of progress since. And the kind of questions that I've been working on and trying to understand is what exactly is the type of mathematical structure that these symmetries have? How do we describe these these topological defects in quantum field theory? in an accurate way? Uh, how can we build interesting examples in higher dimensions? And not just that, how do you describe the symmetries? You know, perhaps they're not just groups, they're something different, but also how do they act on and organize the spectrum of, of observables in quantum field theory? So perhaps the analog of, if you have a group symmetry, this is the, like the analog of the Hilbert space transforming in representations of the group. How, does, how do they act on the, the quantum field theory? And the main thing that I want to talk about today is, is how unitarity, or it will really mean reflection positivity in my talk, is, is incorporated in this set of ideas. And so again, with this analogy, this is kind of like, well, uh, in quantum mechanics, symmetries act by unitary operators on your Hilbert space. And so this is supposed to be the kind of analog of that idea. Okay. What's the plan? So the plan is that I'd like to begin in the first half, really, just by looking at some low-dimensional examples, just to kind of give an idea of what's going on, uh, the type of examples we're interested in, um, and what they can tell you about the general case. Then I'll try to say in part two a bit about the kind of general expectations that we have for the type of mathematical structures we're talking about. Uh, and I'm trying to be a bit cautious with the language here because this is really going to be expectations because I think that uh, the math has not quite been developed yet or is in development. And then I want to give a, a, a large and interesting class of examples uh, called solitonic symmetries, sometimes called topological symmetries, uh, where these really have a, a concrete realization. And then at the end, I'll give some further, further applications. Okay, so let me crack on with some, with some basic examples. So I want to start at the beginning uh, with quantum mechanics and just to review some very basic things. So I want to think about a quantum mechanical system in one dimension. And 
imagine that it just has a finite group symmetry. And so one thing we know is that in this case that there are some unitary operators that are labeled by elements of the group. They commute with the Hamiltonian. That's what we mean by symmetry, and that they're unitary. And the fact that I have a group symmetry is captured in how those operators can Maybe it's because I'm holding it rather than yeah, flicking it. Hold is that the issue? Okay. Oh, okay, that's all it takes. I can. <laughs> control L. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, yeah. So the fact that it's a it's a finite group symmetry is just encoded in how these guys compose. So namely, if I take two, uh, well, they compose according to the group law, perhaps up to a small projective phase alpha. Okay, I can see that I'm going to need to click a bit faster. And that, that small projective phase, it's exactly the one that Aaron was talking about yesterday, at the end of, at the end of yesterday. Uh, what happens is you don't quite get a, a, a representation of your group on the Hilbert space, but you get a projective representation. And this is capturing the idea of an Atuft anomaly. So in this case, just in one dimension, there's a, there's a two cocycle alpha. It's just a, a small phase that captures the anomaly. And then the Hilbert space can transform in a projective unitary representation of the group. Okay. So let me now reformulate this statement slightly uh, in the language and how we like to think about categorical symmetries, which is namely we think about them as topological defects. So in this case, we're just in one dimension. We're living on a line, and the topological defects are just local operators, points. And they're going to be oriented points, and so now we just have some, some topological defects, they're points, and they're labeled by group elements, and they commute with the Hamiltonian, so you can, you can move them up and down the line as you will. And what do you get? Well, if you study these, uh, these local operators, you find that they generated an algebra, which is the twisted group algebra, by taking linear combinations of these generators and looking at how they compose. So for example, I can take two group elements, here, and I can compose them, uh, and then I reproduce the, the group law up to a phase. But there's also a bit more structure. There's the extra structure is that it has the stru uh, a C star algebra structure. So this basically means that there's a notion of dagger, or star, or an, an, anti uh, an involution on the algebra. And this acts in the following way. So it basically takes a group element, and it sends it to its inverse up to a phase, perhaps. And one thing to notice is that this, this star here, this involution, the way it acts is essentially very similar to reversing the orientation of the point. So if I reverse the orientation of the point, I get the opposite group element, or the inverse group element. And so conjugation is essentially the same as, as orientation reversal, perhaps up to a phase. And so another name for this algebra, or this type of uh, a finite dimensional C star algebra, I'm going to call this an O1 dagger algebra. And this is supposed to capture the idea that the dagger structure, or the star, is very closely related to reflections in this case, which is O1. And so this is a notation that I'm borrowing or adapting from uh, this paper here. Control L, you see? Thanks, sorry. Uh, okay, so yeah, I'm gonna call this a, a, a finite dimensional O1 dagger algebra. And the reason for doing this is that this notation here is going to generalize to the other things that I would like to say. Okay. Okay, so this is basically one dimension. It's just a reformulation of, of, of symmetries in quantum mechanics. Uh, in a language that is hopefully going to allow me to lift this to higher dimensions. So let me go on to 2D now, so to a two-dimensional system. I'll be thinking of it in a Euclidean picture. But again, the idea is the same. I just want to look at a system with a finite group symmetry, so a finite group G. And what this means now is that instead of point-like defects, I've got some topological line defects now. 
And the, again, those line defects are labeled by group elements. They have an orientation, and if you flip the orientation of the lines, then you reverse, you take the inverse of the group element. And now the lines can compose in this type of manner, which, um, which again captures the group law. So the group law is in composition. But now the defects are topological, but you have to be a bit careful. There can be additional extra phases as you look at kind of isotopies of the graphs. And in this case, you get exactly such a phase when you look at the associator or this type of picture here where you compose three group elements in, in different orders. Depending on which orders you compose them, you might get an extra phase. And in this case, the phase is captured not by a two co-cycle, but by a three co-cycle. Um, and, and again, that's interpreted as a Tuft anomaly for this, for this symmetry G. So let me now just try to relate that back to um, perhaps a more familiar picture of symmetries in terms of operators acting on a Hilbert space. So to do this, let's just think about for a second the Hilbert space on a circle, okay? So we're quantizing the theory on a circle. And I apologize that my kind of time direction is going along the horizontally. It's gonna help me to draw the pictures a bit more easy, easily. And so what type of structure do we get by by putting the theory on a circle. Well, now I can wrap the line defects around the circle, and they will act as operators on the Hilbert space. And you have a very similar structure, so namely the, the operators can compose according to the group law. And again, there's a notion of, of dagger structure or conjugation, which takes a group element to its inverse again. And so this generates a group algebra in exactly the same way as before. But in this case, the, this doesn't really detect the anomaly in this case. Okay, in one dimension, the anomaly was a, was a two co-cycle, and I could see this in the structure of this composition. But now in three dimensions, we have lines, the anomaly is a three co-cycle, and so I'm not gonna see it in, in pictures like this, unfortunately. So you might ask yourself, well, how, what do I need to do to see the anomaly? And one thing you can do to detect the anomaly is to not just look at the Hilbert space, but to look at what's called the twisted sector Hilbert space, or to add in twisted sectors for the symmetry. Okay. So what does that look like? Well, it looks something like this. Um, so you can now imagine that you have twisted sectors, so what does that mean? It means that you've now inserted a, uh, one of these line defects, in this case horizontally. So this is what I'm calling X. So the twisted sector is labeled by X in this diagram. And so there'll be, there'll be a sector in the Hilbert space, a sum and for each of these Xs. And then you can ask yourself, how does the symmetry act on, on this structure, on the full Hilbert space, including all of the twisted sectors? And something interesting happens because, because of the way these lines compose, then the twisted sectors can get mixed up. They get transformed into each other by the group elements. So I, I think I didn't quite draw it on the picture, but the idea is if you have a twisted sector labeled by a group element X, if you act with a group element G, then it will act by conjugation on, that, uh, on the twisted sector. So this, uh, this now sees the anomaly. Uh, the reason is because you're getting intersections now between, uh, between line defects. But nevertheless, you still generate a very nice algebra structure. So in particular, you can start, uh, you can start composing these intersections. And again, you find that they compose according to the group law up to some small phase. And that phase is going to detect the anomaly. And again, there's a notion of dagger structure. So you get a C star algebra. And again, it's, uh, with respect to the group element that's acting, it, it acts by taking it to its inverse up to some phase. And it kind of flips the direction of the diagram. So it, you know, it takes something that's acting to the right and produces something that's acting to the left. Yeah. 
So what structure does this have? Well, it generates what's called uh, the twisted Drenfeld double, or the twisted groupoid algebra for the action of G on itself by conjugation. And the twist here refers to this, this phase tau. And in terms of the anomaly, there's some expression here, but it's just, it's, it's what's called the transgression of the Tuft anomaly. So it's some combination of these phases that appears in this, in this factor. And it appears both in, the, in how these defects compose and also in the star structure here. Okay. So again, this, this, is, uh, this is an algebra. It has a product. It has a star. They have some nice properties. And it has this structure of a C star algebra or an O1 DAG algebra. Okay. So this is pretty much it for group-like symmetries. Question. Is this map from alpha to tau always invertible? Yeah, uh, it's a question I should know the answer to. Um, I suspect probably not, but... Uh, because that would mean that there are anomalies that you cannot capture this way. Yeah. It's a good question. I don't think I know the answer. Um, but yeah, I, I would agree with you that if, that if, it's, if that's the case, there would, be, there would be anomalies that can't be captured. Yeah. I should say, I mean, even, even worse is true in some sense that you can have different groups, I think, that have the same group algebra over the complex numbers. So something, is, something even worse than that is true. OK, good. So this is all I want to say about invertible symmetries. So let me now give an example of a non-invertible symmetry. And so one thing perhaps to say here is that, you see, I, I didn't really need to do this. I could have a kind of well-defined subsector, a well-defined subalgebra by just throwing away the twisted sectors. But it's kind of useful to introduce them. I see the anomaly. But when we come to non-invertible symmetries, the difference is that I, I really need the twisted sectors to get a reasonable structure. Let me give an example, which is a small variation on what we just did. So I'll call this for now a Tambari Yamagami symmetry. So it's basically what we had before, except I'm going to take the group G, I'm going to call it A, and require it to be an abelian group, and I'm going to require it to be anomaly free. And then we're going to supplement that structure by just one additional line, which is non invertible. Okay. Uh, that I'll call N, and N has the property that it's, it's, it's self-dual, and also that uh, if you take its fusion, it can fuse into any of the other group elements A. Okay, so it has a fusion rule that looks something, uh, something like this here. The N squared is a sum over all of the other group elements, and because of that, this is, uh, this is not really an invertible, it's, not, it's a non-invertible symmetry. Okay, so it has some behavior like this. And then there's some additional data that you need to, to give, not just the line, but you also need to give some more data that fixes all of the associators of N with itself uh, and with all of the other group elements. And that gives some additional data. And then you have to choose a uh, kind of by character, chi, and then there's a choice of square root. Okay. So this type of structure was introduced in 98 by Tambara Yamagami. Um, and various examples of this can be realized in, um, in various physical systems. For example, the icing symmetry comes from taking this group just to be Z2 um, and appears in the critical icing model. OK, but other than that, we want to play the same game. We'd like to understand, so suppose now that I put my system on a circle, and I ask, well, how does this symmetry act on the Hilbert space? And in what sense is that a unitary action? In what sense is it compatible with quantum mechanics? But the idea is very much the same. We need to look at uh, not just the Hilbert space on a circle, but the Hilbert space with all the twisted sectors. So there'll be a twisted sector labeled by each of these lines. 
And then all of the elements uh, can now act on the Hilbert space. And they generate, again, a type of algebra that you get by doing this. So here's, uh, I didn't want to write it all out, but here's one example. So in the example here, I'm just looking at the twisted sectors labeled by A that are labeled by the, the group elements A, the invertible elements. And then I'm looking at how the new duality defect or non-invertible symmetry N acts on those. And again, it can act by, it can interchange all of the twisted sectors. It can change one twisted sector to another. And it does so with various phases that are, that are captured by, uh, by these, well, this additional data that we had to specify. So in particular here, if I act twice with, uh, with n, I can get any group element in the middle, and I have to take a sum. And um, sorry, that's uh, for a fixed group element b in the middle, uh, I get a sum over invertible element c that are acting. And then there's some extra phases that captures this data. And again, you can equip this with a, with a star structure or a dagger structure quite naturally, um, and it acts in the following way. Again, n is self-dual, so this, this structure is perhaps not unexpected. Uh, and if, if it acts by taking twisted sector A to twisted sector B, its dagger will do the reverse, up to a small phase. So th this type of algebra that you get by putting the theory on a circle is sometimes called the tube algebra of the symmetry. And again, in this instance, it has the structure of a finite dimensional C star algebra, or O1 dagger algebra. And again, you can go away and classify all of the irreducible representations, unitary irreducible representations. There's a finite number of them. And so your, your Hilbert space will then decompose into, uh, into these irreducible representations. And the idea is that that captures the implications of your symmetry uh, as far as your, your, quantum account, your quantum system goes. So, so these are some examples. So what, what type of structure do we need in general in two dimensions? Well, this is already fairly well known. And, the, and what I didn't really say in the previous slides is that the, the structure that I was starting from that governed my topological line defects was that of a unitary fusion category. So let me try to give a, a, a brief overview of of the structure that that has, intuitively. So the first thing it has is, is duals of objects. We saw examples of that in the previous slides. This is the thing that I get by flipping the orientation of the lines. So in the group-like case, it was taking a group element to its inverse. The thing that I didn't show quite explicitly was that you need a, a dagger structure on morphisms. And then you need some kind of compatibility between these things that tells you how they interact. And the basic idea of that is that whatever that structure is, it should ensure that you can have an consi almost consistent graphical calculus so you can, where you can draw these line defects um, and insert them uh, as you like on, on oriented two manifolds. Yeah, you, I think that's so. What, so yeah, what is dagger? So that's an auto functor on this on this ca fusion category. Y you can lift it to, to such a thing, yeah. And okay, so it acts on both opposite. objects and morphisms, and on objects, it's the usual duality. No, no, the, the, the dagger is going to act trivially on the objects. So okay, so it's okay, so it acts trivially on the objects, and then it's. Some, if you had a linear category, it would, oh, sorry, if you had a linear category with a Hermitian structure on the, on the morphism spaces, then it would be ordinary adjoint. Yeah, okay. exactly, yeah, just so. Okay. So again, uh, th this is a unitary fusion category. All of the examples I gave have this structure. Um, and borrowing or adapting the notation from this, uh, this paper, uh, I'm going to call this an O2 fusion category, or O2 dagger fusion category. And again, the idea is O2 because I'm in two dimensions now. I'm working with oriented theories, but 
there's a notion in which the dagger is very closely related to reflection, and so that's what this O2 dagger notation is supposed to be capturing. Okay, and so what's the general idea? Well, the general idea is that given, given a unitary fusion category, or an O2 dagger fusion category, you, there's a notion of integration, um, or let's say it the, the following way. So the way that that fusion category is going to act on the Hilbert space, more generally on observables in quantum field theory, is by performing a kind of integration of that category. So this is some version of factorization homology, I think. Uh, but I'm just going to use it as a notation here for now. And so the idea is really being that you're, you're putting the theory on a circle. You're kind of integrating your, your structure in some way over that circle uh, to produce an algebra that actually acts on the Hilbert space. That's the intuition. So uh, at the moment, this is just some notation for this uh, slightly vague construction that I've given in examples where from some fusion category, you can produce a nice algebra or a nice C star algebra. But the basic point of this is that if you ask yourself the question, well, what structure do I need to put on my original category in order to get a nice C star algebra that's compatible with quantum mechanics, then the answer is it needs to be a unitary fusion category. And you need all of that data on the previous slide to, get, to reproduce this nice C star structure. Or to say it more formally, if you start with an O2 dagger fusion structure on your original symmetry category, that will ensure that you have an O1 dagger algebra structure on this, uh, this tube algebra, the thing that acts on the Hilbert space on a circle. So the idea is that this is supposed to provide some kind of link or direct link between perhaps two different notions of unitarity. On the one hand, there's a kind of math notion. You have a unitary fusion category. And on the other hand, you have a more perhaps standard physics notion in terms of a Hilbert space and your quantum mechanics. And this is supposed to provide a direct link between those two pictures. Okay. Is integration the endomorphism identity object? So, I mean, there's another way you can go from, you can reduce category number, yeah. you, I'm sure you know, which is looping. So you, if you have a monoidal yeah. N category, you can go to N minus yeah. one by taking the automorphism the endomorphisms of uh, the identity object. Is, it's, it's is not, that what this integration no, is? No, it's not quite that, but it's very close. It's a bit more like taking a sum of, of simple objects and then taking endomorphisms of, of something like that. So it, it's close to that, but not, not quite that. OK, uh, so this was two dimensions. What about higher? So let me. So when we go up to three dimensions, already things get quite a bit more complicated for a number of reasons. So on the one hand, you can have lines and surfaces now. Um, you can also study the Hilbert space. There's a lot more choices, right? You can pick uh, some closed surface, a two-sphere or a torus or so on. And there are going to be lots of different types of twisted sexes that you can consider. So I'm, I'm not going to try to give the full structure, but just try to give a kind of example, basically. Uh, so here's my example. Um, it's very close to the, a finite group. It's what's called a finite two group. The simplest type, a split two group. There should be some references here. I apologize for that. But what's the basic picture? The picture is that there are some surfaces that are labeled by group elements G of the group G. There are some line defects, some topological lines that are labeled by elements of the one-form symmetry group A, that's abelian. And there's an action of one on the other, which is interpreted in this way is that, you know, if you have a line that pierces the surface, it comes out the other side con uh, with the action. And again, there's a notion of a Tufft anomaly. Well, uh, there are lots of Tufft anomalies in, in principle, but I'm going to look at a particular one that's, a, that's labeled by uh, a two co-cycle on G with values in the dual of A. And that's captured in a very similar way uh, to the previous slides. You study the composition of pairs of these surfaces with a line going through the middle. And they don't quite compose according to the group law, but they do so up to some small phase that's constructed from the anomaly. 
And so again, you can ask yourself, well, suppose that I now put this on a sphere or a torus. Um, what structure, what algebra do I get, and how does it act on the Hilbert space? So here's, here's the picture. So let me just focus on the simplest case, which is a two-sphere. Then it's almost identical to the previous slide. So in particular, you have uh, the, the group elements compose in this way, just like in the previous slide, and there's a natural notion of a dagger structure. And it generates uh, a very similar thing. It's kind of twisted groupoid algebra in this case. But again, the main point is that there's a very natural way to integrate over a two-sphere to produce an algebra, a C star algebra, and then that acts on the Hilbert space. Okay. So what kind of general structure? Well, um, again, we're kind of lifting up one dimension. And the idea is that the thing that we need to start with is now a unitary fusion two category. So there are surfaces and lines and points. So there's one level higher. And it comes equipped with a whole load of structure. There's a notion of duals on objects. There has to be now two notions of dagger for one morphisms and two morphisms, and a whole bunch of compatibility conditions between those two things, whose idea is to ensure that you can consistently or almost consistently uh, draw these types of pictures that I've been drawing. OK. Uh, I write that because of uh, a Tuft anomaly is, in some sense, a slight obstruction to having a perfect graphical calculus, I would say. That's all I mean by that. OK. And again, just like before, I mean, it, it's, it's exactly the same, but the idea is you want to start with some structure, in this case, a unitary fusion two category. There's some notion of integration over a surface. And you can produce from that a, a C star algebra that, that captures how this acts on, on your Hilbert space. So this should give some motivation for the kind of structures um, that we'd like to put on, on symmetries, on these type of higher fusion categories. And so in the second half of the talk, uh, or just I want to talk about um, what the kind of general expectations are for those structures more broadly. OK, and so here, well, before I do that, um, I want to say a few words about symmetry type. And so Aaron did me a favor yesterday in describing this really nicely. So really, before you start, you should ask yourself what type of fields you have in your quantum field theory. Does it have just bosons? Does it also have fermions? Uh, does it have time reversal symmetry? and so on and so forth. And attached to that type of data, there's a notion of symmetry type, which captures these things, uh, which is a choice of tangential structure. Um, OK, and this structure, it, in some sense, it encodes these principles of relativity and unitarity. So relativity is, is captured by the fact that this tangential structure should be relativistic which means in some sense that the symmetries should contain SON. I'm a Euclidean signature here. And then unitarity is encoded in, in what's called the extended symmetry group. So it's a zeta extension of, of this H. Um, and that's capturing this extra kind of reflection that you need to add that, that must be correlated with, with the daggers. So this type of structure was. Uh, was, uh, was described nicely in, in the work of Frieden Hopkins on reflection positive field theories. Uh, and so everything that I've been saying so far in my examples have all been this line here. So I've been looking at oriented theories, theories, say, with just bosons. In this case, that extend, so H there is SO. The extended group is O. That's why I've been writing O dagger everywhere. Uh, but in principle, one needs to, you can have all of these structures for, for all of these other choices as well, and you should be able to formulate these structures in those cases too. So what type of structure do we need? So the idea is that symmetries, or more particularly finite type of symmetries, 
are captured by a collection of categories. So I'm going to label them by two, in, two indices here, N and D. So D is always going to be the space, Euclidean space-time dimension. And N is going to be the dimension of the topological defects that I'm looking at. So N is, that means that N is also the categorical degree. It's an N category. And its structure depends very much on, on, uh, on this choice of tangential structure or the symmetry type. And then there's some relation between all of these objects that, that captures the idea that, well, if you have an n-dimensional defect, one way to view that in a silly way is there's a, it's a junction between trivial n plus 1 dimensional defects. And there's some structure that goes along with that that I, I think I won't describe in any more detail. So the question is, well, what exactly, what structure exactly do these higher categories have? And that, of course, depends on this choice of tangential structure. And I, I want to kind of give some hopes or words or maybe a bit more than that, but expectations about the structure that these categories have. Um, and the reason I say expectations is because largely the, I think the mathematics is still under development. So the idea is that you pick a, a symmetry type. So in all my examples, it was SO. And then this category CND, that captures the n-dimensional defects in d-dimensions, is what I'm going to call a H dagger, a H hat D dagger E D minus N fusion N category. So there's a lot going on here. <laughs> okay. So let me try to unpack it a bit. So first there's the N category. This is the idea that the defects are n-dimensional. Okay, that's what that's capturing. Then there's the fusion structure, and that's telling you how the defects can fuse. And so that cares about the co-dimension of the defects. It tells you what the transverse space looks like when I'm trying to, to compose them. And then there's the really important thing for this talk, which is this uh, H dagger structure. Uh, and that's the thing that's really capturing unitarity or extended unitarity. And the basic idea is similar to the examples, but there's a whole bunch of structures here, including duals and daggers for all the various morphisms, and they have to obey some compatibility conditions, um, with the idea being that you can consistently draw the type of pictures that I've been trying to draw in a consistent way. And I think that uh, there's hope that we can make this structure very precise using some very recent work on dagger n categories. Okay, let me give a couple of examples. I'll just go back to the examples that I've already done to tell you what they look like. So if I take the symmetry type to be S-O. Sorry, Matt, Matt, could I ask another question? I'm really confused about what you're doing here. So yeah. in the cobordism hypothesis, we, we to an n-dimensional field theory, we would associate an n category, right? Yeah. But you have many n categories. Are you just, are you just de-looping them? No, no. Why do you have? Why do you? In the cobordism hypothesis, you would have for an n-dimensional field theory, you would have n a single n category, and that captures all the structure of the defects. So why you have sep Why do you have separate n categories? This is more like the tangle hypothesis. Okay. So what I'm doing is I'm looking at n-dimensional defects in d dimensions. Okay. And so when you look at the tangle hypothesis, there's not just one category. There's a whole, a whole set of them. So this is very much analogous to that. They're not all unrelated because of this, this type of relation here. So they're not, they're not necessarily de-loopings of each other, but they loop down to the, yeah. So what's the arrow? Is that a morphism or uh, that, that's, an equivalence uh, or that's what? That's an equivalence of whatever structure that I'm, that I'm okay. describing on the next page, yeah. So if you like, you could take the top one, uh, and that would be enough. But OK, so here's some examples. So uh, an O1 dagger E1 algebra, that's just the thing we started with. That's a finite dimensional C star algebra. There's an O2 dagger E1 fusion category. That's a unitary fusion category. It's again, describes symmetries in 2D, and similarly in 3D. 
And then you can look at other symmetry types, and so spin is giving you something like uh, super versions of these or Z2 graded versions of these. And then if you want to look at theories with, uh, with time reversal, then you're kind of supplementing these things with a type of reality structure that interplays with this in a certain way. Okay. And then the general kind of idea is that the, thank you, the, um, the action of symmetries in a, on a quantum field theory uh, on kind of observables like the Hilbert space or perhaps something else comes from taking this structure and integrating it over, over some space. So, so one example, so for one thing to have in mind is if you're interested in, say, uh, operators of a given dimension, you should take the sphere that links them, and that's the thing that you want to integrate over. So an example that we've already done is when you take the symmetry type to be SO. You take N and K both to be D minus 1. So I'm looking at co-dimension 1 defects. And then if you integrate uh, this symmetry category over a co-dimension 1 manifold, then you're just going to get an algebra, the star algebra, and that's the thing that will act on the Hilbert space unitarily. Okay, um, so in the last 10 minutes, I want to talk about a particular class of examples uh, that I'll call solitonic symmetries or topological symmetries. But I really want to go back to an even simpler case, which is no symmetry at all, because this, this is already slightly non-trivial in this setting. So, before I get to solitonic symmetries, let me say something about the case where you just you pick a symmetry type, so SO or spin, but you have no internal or global symmetry. So this is the very tri the most trivial case. But you still have something non-trivial in this structure because you can always take some TQFT that can be embedded in higher dimensions and you can just plonk it on some uh, a manifold inside of your space-time, and that will give you some topological defect. It's a very trivial one, but it's there. So another way to think about this is that whatever this, uh, whatever these, this structure is, it's a bit like the coefficient system that you're working with. You can always stack your topological defects with, with kind of decoupled trivial ones. And so we should understand this first. And so the, the basic mantra here is that n-dimensional defects are basically n-dimensional TQFTs that, that you can embed in d-dimensions. And this is the type of thing, uh, this, this is the type, or this is the realm of the Tangle hypothesis. I won't say too much about that, but just to say that these categories are really variations on finite dimensional higher Hilbert spaces or n-Hilbert spaces, or slight refinement of that idea. So let me try and give a few examples just to, to set the stage. And again, let me focus on all, uh, the SO, the oriented case, uh, in which all... So first of all, for point defects, we're just looking at you know, topological operators. There's not much going on there. There's not much that can happen. Um, and it doesn't matter you know, wh what the dimension that you embed the points in. There's basically only a single point operator, the identity operator, that you can multiply by complex numbers. And so in this case, all of these things are basically just C. But this notation is supposed to capture what structure you're uh, equipping C with when you do these computations. And that's slightly different. So in the, in the zero case, this is just points in zero dimensions. It's basically just C as a vector space. If you go up to one dimension, points can compose and form an algebra. That's just C as an algebra. And if I go to higher dimensions, well, the points can now compose in higher dimensions, so it has to be commutative, which of course it is, but this notation is capturing what structure uh, it could a priori have. Okay, and then we go up to line defects and we recover things that are, that are fairly familiar. So if you have just line defects in one dimensions, 
Well, that's just a, a, a category, in this case, a unitary category. If you have lines in two dimensions, that was a case we studied that we looked at earlier, uh, you, you're, you're in the business of having a unitary fusion category. Lines in three dimensions can braid, so you get a braided fusion category. And then higher up, everything stabilizes, and you get a symmetric fusion category in this case. And in this case, they're all just variations on the category of Hilbert spaces and linear maps, or finite dimensional Hilbert spaces and linear maps, where the dagger structure is exactly dagger on uh, adjoint of linear maps. So th th this type of structure really forms the kind of coefficient system or the base that you have in the game. And, uh, and so, well, what about surfaces? If I go one dimension higher, this is where things become a little bit more intricate. It's a bit harder to say exactly what a two Hilbert space is. And in particular, there's a difference between what I call Hilb 2.2 and what I call Hilb 2.3. And that's very closely related to um, the ideas about to the existence of Euler TQFTs, which are TQFTs that are kind of fine inherently as a TQFT, but can't necessarily be embedded in a higher dimensional space time. And so you have to distinguish these types of things. So let me then come in the last uh, five minutes to say a few words about solitonic symmetries. So what's the idea? Well, the idea is that these are the symmetries that you get in a sigma model. And they're the type of symmetries that come from the topology of the sigma model. So an example would be a winding number symmetry. The reason we say they're, they're solitonic symmetries is because the type of charged objects or charged operators you get are, are topological solitons or behave like topological solitons. So the idea here is very similar to that before, but now you think about the n-dimensional defects as not just n-dimensional TQFTs that can be embedded in d-dimensions, but you have to equip those TQFTs with a coupling uh, in some sense to the space X or to the sigma model. So that gives a bit of extra structure to these things. And the way that can be encoded is, is that you, you essentially study some version of higher local systems on, on the target space X. So what does that mean? Well, these are symmetries that know about the topology of the target. And in fact, if I'm, in, if I'm asking about n-dimensional defects, all they really know about the target is the, the homotopy n-type, which you can think about as being captured by this uh, homotopy n-groupoid. And then you look at functors from that, preserving the appropriate structure into these, uh, these universal categories or coefficient system. So this is a kind of variation on the theme of you know, representations, representations of the fundamental group or local systems. It reproduces the, uh, the known invertible symmetry. And it gives you a large, a large class of examples to play with. I think uh, given that I'm out of time, well, let me just give one example, uh, which is a sigma model in four dimensions to CP1. This goes slightly outside my assumptions, but think is, is still valid in this instance. Um, and in this case, you can really kind of classify the type of, uh, the type of symmetries you get by studying these functors. And the type of symmetry the, that you get has appeared in this type of Q mod Z type classification uh, that you find in a, in a whole bunch of interesting examples, like a CP1 sigma model in 4D, uh, but also electrodynamics and, and other things. Um, OK. I think given the time, uh, I ought to finish there. There's a few applications, so I'll, I'll maybe just leave those. Thanks a lot. Okay, thanks, man, for the great talk. Um, time for questions. Uh, hi. Uh, 
Uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, so I guess for fusion categories, we can check whether it's unitary by checking whether the quantum dimensions are positive and making sure the associators are some unitary matrices. Yeah. So for fusion two categories, do, the, do we have a statement in terms of the 10 J symbols or? Uh, I, I don't think we're at that level yet okay. of, of development, yeah. I don't think the technology exists yet to, to answer that question. Okay, thank you. Guys, I'm aware. Uh, could you uh, more precisely situate what is happening in this talk with regards to the cavoidism hypothesis? And uh, like, are you telling us something old, something new, a new th an old thing in new ways? Or what exactly is the relationship? Yeah. Let me try to say a few more words. Um, maybe if I go back to somewhere along here. So. What I'm trying to do is a unitary version of the Tangle hypothesis, okay? of which you, I think you can view the Cabordism hypothesis as a certain limit. So in that sense, it's like I'm trying to do a kind of unitary version of the Cabordism hypothesis. Okay, so, uh, so this collection here, I mean, if you, take, uh, if you take kind of N to be, well, okay. I think to recover the situation of the Cabordism hypothesis, what you're really doing is trying to take D to be very large. So, I'm um, with Tangle hypothesis instead. Just, you're happy uh, with that? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How, how is it different from Tangle hypothesis? Then I'm trying to do, I'm basically trying to do, so the Tangle hypothesis, or a unitary version of the Tangle hypothesis, is basically supposed to be the construction of this universal example of higher Hilbert spaces. Okay. And then I'm trying to kind of abstract the, the structure that those categories have uh, a little bit away from the the Tangle hypothesis, and, and ask uh, and propose that symmetries more generally should have that structure. You know, symmetries are about, you know, topological defects in a fixed space-time dimension, so this is... So you're saying beyond topological QFTs? That's certainly true, but that's not the sense in which I meant. Uh, so, so, so. Yeah, so what does abstract mean? What's more abstract than Tangle hypothesis? Well, well th th this is only one example. This is Hilb, okay? But there, there, are many other, there are many other type of examples, so. Well, uh, okay. The example I talked about here with solitonic symmetries, that that's also could be viewed as an example of the Tangle hypoth hypothesis where you're equipping the tangles with extra structure of a map into some space X. So again, that could also be viewed in the realm of the Tango hypothesis. But I don't know if all symmetries are like that. Further questions? Hi, Matt. Thanks for the talk. Uh, well, Usually, one feature of symmetry that we that we uh, highlight is that uh, symmetry tend to act on things. There is a, yeah. and and this action, uh, if we want to say that a symmetry is a symmetry of a quantum field theory, has to be faithful. So so, uh, th there should be some some notion in which the symmetry acts non trivially on some operators, maybe some yeah. local operators or extended defects. Or uh, yeah. can you comment on that, or is there a? Yeah. So I mean, I guess that's a question of completeness in some sense, right? So. I mean, maybe if I take you back all the way to the, the uh, my very first, let's go back to Tambari Hamagami, for example, right? You might expect, uh, you know, in, the, in this case, just in two dimensions, you can really classify the number of irreducible representations, and, right? And you, if you have the symmetry, you would expect to see all of them appear, right? So to give an example, if you take the, the critical icing model, uh, there are, um, how many are there? There are nine irreducible representations. And I think all of them are realized once in terms of chiral primaries. So it has all, it has all of the structure there in a minimal way. So, and the general idea would be similar to that, right? Is that once you're able to classify this structure, classify the irreducible representations, or perhaps higher representations in this case, 
then you should you should expect similar comments there. So, yeah. Maybe just to follow up on Tangle Hypothesis. I would have thought that unitarity would be about, uh, maybe you even said this, about time reversal, reversal or something like that. So I would have thought to get a unitary version of Tangle Hypothesis, you would just say something like, take Tangle Hypothesis, take fixed points, like maybe homotopy fixed points under some uh, involution that comes from imposing time reversal, and then there's your answer. So how is that related to... Uh, I, I very much hope that you can derive what I'm writing here in the manner that you just explained. I, I just, uh, that's beyond me at the moment. But I, I completely agree with that philosophy, yeah. Further questions? Uh, is there a clear notion of a non invertibility for the topological point like operators? But could you say the word again? Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. So, it, it, is there a clear notion for non invertible symmetry for topological point like operators? Yeah. I mean, for extended operator, we can define simple objects, and then starting from that, we define fusion rules, and then we know it's non invertible, right? But yeah. For point operators, yeah, is there a clear right. notion? Yeah. So, um, this maybe goes back to an earlier question in some sense as well, but yeah, so, so basically the structure you have here is a finite dimensional C star algebra. So these are pretty, pretty simple. They're just all some, they're always a sum of matrix algebras, finite dimensional matrix algebras, where the star structure is given by adjoint on each of the factors. So the question is, can you realize all of those as the group algebra for some finite group uh, with a, or perhaps twisted group algebra for some finite group? Uh, I think the answer is yes, but. Uh. Yeah, because at the pra practical level, I can just make kind of, I mean, my favorite complex coefficient linear combination of any point operator to make a new point operator. So it yeah. seems like whatever fusion rule I write down, I can always rewrite it in terms of some finite group I think symmetry. so, yeah. yeah. yeah and okay. as I said earlier, there's the feature that, you know, I think if you take D8 and Q8, I think they have the same group algebra over the complex numbers, for example, so, yeah. Whereas if you, well, if, if you, ch but if you change the symmetry type, for example, if you were to do O rather than SO, you would be over the reals and then you would detect the difference. Okay, well, if there are no further questions, let's thank uh, Matt again for the great talk. <laughs>